OK, let's talk about these questions. Number one, this was uh, taken by a couple of groups. Why do they want to do this? And do you agree? Well, the answer is not e exactly spelled out for us, but you can find something very close on page 24, the seventh point. The aim, in short, should be to orientate ourselves towards placing Kenya, East Africa, and then Africa in the center. All other things are to be considered in their relevance to our situation and their contribution towards understanding ourselves. So they think that the point is to help us understand our own situation and our own culture, and therefore we reject the primacy of English literature and culture because it's not ours. And for this reason, they want to change the English department into the Department of African Languages and Literature or Literature and Languages. Do you agree? Uh, so when I was talking to you guys about this question, you all had the same answer, which is why can't we do both? We can keep the English department and everybody who wants to teach African literature and language can go over there and start their own department. Isn't that great? And the fact is that's exactly what happened. If you look at footnote one, this debate this is on page 23. This debate resulted in the establishment of two departments, languages and literature. In both, African languages and literature were to form the core. However, so it looks like even the languages department is also focused on African languages. But uh, the authors also say on page 24, nine, the ninth point, we know that European literatures constitute one source of influence on modern African literatures in English, French, and Portuguese. And then at the bottom of the page, their proposal is that in addition to Swahili, French, and English, they will also teach other languages. So even in their proposed new department, they would still teach English. They would still teach French. They would still teach Swahili. Swahili is kind of like an international language across Africa. They don't speak it natively in East Africa, but many Africans can still understand it. Um, so even in their new department, they would not only teach their own language and culture. They would still teach these international languages. And when you teach a language, you also have to teach a little bit of the culture. So it looks like at the end of the day, they have an African literature department and they have a language department that begins from Africa, but also includes more international languages. So that's kind of your answer, right? Why can't we do both? They ended up doing both. So the, the further question, therefore, is why didn't the authors propose to do both? Why did they focus on only uh, Kenya and Eastern Africa. Uh, one group pointed out that the title is already very provocative, right? We're going to abolish the English department. No more English. It sounds extreme. Um, but perhaps uh, we should remember that this essay was written for a debate inside their department. Right. This is a comment on the paper presented by the acting head of the English department. Uh, so it's responding to a discussion within their own department. It's not written for a newspaper. Uh, only later was this published uh, for the public. So if you think about this essay as one part of a debate, then in a debate, one important strategy is to get everybody to think about something completely new and completely different. The point is not to actually realize this exact idea. The point is to make people think in this direction. 
and to kind of change what they think could be possible. In political science, they call this concept the Overton window. Some guy named Overton came up with the comparison of it's like a window of possibility. If you talk about something outside of this window of possibility, you might be able to shift the window in that direction. So maybe the reason they said something so extreme is because if they didn't say it, then the African literature department would not have been born. Right, the point is not to cancel English. The point is to open up new possibilities. Um, and that's something I think you should remember when you watch a political show or like a news channel where people are arguing about things. They may not actually believe exactly what they say. Maybe they're just trying to get you to change what you think is possible. You should also remember this when you face propaganda from like China and Russia and I don't know Iran, but also the US. A lot of propaganda is not trying to convince you that they're right. A lot of propaganda is trying to convince you that maybe uh, your side is not always right. Or like, for example, if we consider Chinese propaganda toward Taiwan, the point is not to make everybody believe we should return to China. The point is to think, hmm, maybe our government is not that right. Maybe there's some place in the middle that makes more sense. Um, so, you know, this works in both directions. If you want to change somebody's possibilities or if somebody is trying to change your possibilities, it's it's a very important thing to remember especially when we live here in a high tech society with many different influences. Question two. So part of the reason the authors want to do this is they say that the primary duty, you know, this question, there are three points here, right? To better understand ourselves as a people, to see how we face challenges and to discover ways to develop. Do you agree? And um, I talked again to a couple of groups about this question and they agree that this is the fundamental duty of a department that is related to culture, especially our own culture or their own culture. But this may not be the only thing they should do. Universities, I think we can all agree, the first duty of any university is to share knowledge, right? To let students know more than before they came to school. But a university can do other things in addition to this. One group mentioned maybe uni the university can help push students in a more progressive political direction. Maybe, maybe not there. If you decide to go in a certain political direction, you also have to recognize that some people will disagree with you. Uh, so it would not be as universal a university. Um, other things might be like to help inspire people to make use of the knowledge that they learn. Um, but all of these depend on sharing knowledge. At the, so I think uh, the groups I talked to all agreed with this idea. But we should also remember that important universities such as this university, uh, what, what was it called, the University of Kenya or something? Uh, university of East Africa at that time and even today is a very important university in that part of the world. For these kinds of important universities, another part of their duty is their duty to society and their duty to the country. They offer knowledge, but they also offer possibility. Um, the idea like when we think about Africa in the 1960s, it was not exactly 
the richest place in the world. It was not the most peaceful place in the world. They had been colonized by the British for a long time. After recently gaining independence, they had to learn how to do democracy properly. There were many social issues. There were many economic issues. But even then, or I should say, especially then, the idea of the university can be very inspiring. The idea of a place where the smartest people in the country gather together to come up with new ideas and new solutions to important problems. Uh, the possibility of maybe one day joining these people or even just taking part in these discussions. The idea that not all of us are stuck in um, poverty, that not all of us are stuck in war zones, that there is something better possible for our society. This is a very important part of a university's duty to show that possibility. Recently, um, the university system has codified this duty into something known as USR, University's Social Responsibility. Uh, the subtitles are wrong. One S, USR. Okay. The USSR is the Soviet Union, Sudan, so not that one. Um, and so the idea is that universities should design programs for the community and for people who are not students because the university is always related and connected to its community and to its country. So from that perspective, Abolishing the English department would be a very strong signal and symbol for the society. It's saying that, yes, we have been being controlled by the British for many years, but now we are going to refocus on our traditions and our own culture. It's signaling what the government and what, uh, let's say, intellectual people think is important for this new uh, as a newly independent country. Uh, of course, we have to balance the symbolic considerations with the practical considerations, and I think that's also reflected in the solution. Even when they teach English and French, they still the, the language department still focuses on African languages. Um, and that's part of the symbolism of the university. Question three, education is a means of knowledge about ourselves. I talked to two groups about this question and both of them agreed. Uh, and their idea is when we learn about culture, we are learning about ourselves. Like in this class, we're talking about African people, but really we're thinking about ourselves. Why do we? study English? Why are we studying British literature? Is it really important to remember when Queen Victoria died or when Queen Elizabeth died? Or is the point really to think about how they lived, what they thought? How is that related to American and British people today? And how can we interact and engage with that culture? So really it's about ourselves. Um, but these groups also agree with this idea, even when we're studying something technical, something that really seems focused on the knowledge, uh, things like um, like international relations or things like uh, you know chemistry or or science, right, or math. Even when we're learning these technical ideas, this special knowledge. We're also learning about ourselves. How do we understand these ideas? What, how much importance do we give to these ideas? How do they change the way we look at the world? I guarantee you, if you take a physics class that is highly specialized and you survive and you come out the other side, it will change the way you look at the world. Um, but 
uh, one group went even further than this. They said, even if you decide you hate this class and you're not going to use any of this knowledge, that is still learning about yourself. It's still learning which parts you enjoy, which parts you don't think are important, and how much you're willing to suffer to get those two credits. So in the end, no matter what you learn, you're always learning about yourself in addition to everything else. Um, well, we should still look at this page, right? Why is the page number wrong? I need to fix the page number. Uh, let's see. Here. The uh, education is a means of knowledge about ourselves. So they're saying it's not just a change of names. We want to establish the centrality of Africa in the department. So because education is learning about ourselves, the authors think that we should specifically focus on something re directly related to our culture and ourselves. From this point of view, uh, you know, it does make a kind of sense. If you're learning about yourself, then you might as well study yourself. But at the same time, you don't have to study yourself in order to learn about yourself. Like the causality is not so connected. But I think they proposed many other ideas to support their policy. OK, number four, what is the main point of the second essay and why do you agree? Let's take a look. So the second essay is called Commonwealth Literature Does Not Exist, but our textbook gave a title to its two selections. English is an Indian literary language. And. Oh, sorry, no, it, that's what it calls this selection. The main idea here is that English is not just for English people or by English people. English literature has its Indian branch. This is page 29. By this, I mean the literature of the English language. So English literature in this class, we call this British literature because we're studying literature in England. But for this author, Salman Rushdie, English literature is literature that is written in English. And so, of course, it will also include literature that is Indian literature. There is no incompatibility here. If history creates complexities, let us not try to simplify them. So we can say that the main point of this selection is to argue that you don't have to be so careful about studying English or not studying English. If English is already a part of your society and a part of your daily life, then English is your language too. It doesn't just belong to the British. And so the author is arguing that we don't have to like cut off the English language part of our culture. We can embrace the way that we have influenced English. Uh, and then he takes it further. It is completely fallacious, which means wrong, to suppose that there is such a thing as a pure, unalloyed tradition from which to draw. There's no such thing as a pure tradition. History is full of complexities. Even like classical history or, or uh, medieval history, people have always been moving around, exchanging culture, learning from their neighbors. There's no such thing as a pure tradition. Um, and so nobody took this question, but personally, I agree with the author. I think living in Taiwan, we can see many, many examples of this idea, right? W like when you say Taiwanese, what exactly are you talking about? And can you separate that from other cultures. 
it's very hard, right? Uh, Taiwan has been influenced by or controlled by at least five different cultures, maybe more. Uh, and today we in Taiwan are influenced by all of those cultures. So when the author says there's no such thing as a pure tradition, I think it should make a lot of sense to us. Right, if you think about Taiwanese, can you separate that very cleanly from being Chinese? Can you separate that very cleanly from being Japanese? Can you separate that from our indigenous traditions? Can you separate that from American culture, um, which we benefited a lot from after, during and after, no, after World War II? Being Taiwanese is a combination of all of that. And it's also more than that, right? We're not just Chinese plus Japanese plus American, et cetera, right? We are, we've created our own culture out of these elements. So as a Taiwanese person, I do agree with this very much. So question five, these two essays look at English from two very different perspectives. The first essay, proposes to abolish the English department because uh, we are not part of Britain and Europe. The second essay thinks that we should embrace our literature in English because it is a part of our history. Our people use this language and write in this language. Which one do you think makes more sense and why? Again, nobody took this question, but I think it should be clear that I think the second essay makes more sense. When we were talking about the first essay, I already pointed out that it also agrees that language and culture are a mixture, right? It says we will still teach English and French. It says Portuguese is also part of our cultural heritage. Uh, and we also discussed how the first essay is more of a polemic, Wenzang. Right, it's trying to change people's minds. It's not always trying to do exactly what it says. Um, so I think the authors of the first essay would would also agree with the author of the second essay, even though they're divided by I think ten or twenty years. At the same time, the first essay warns us to be careful about continuing colonial influences. Just because Britain is no longer controlling our country does not mean that Britain is no longer controlling our culture. Uh, if you are newly independent from the British Empire, but you still study British history, you still study British literature instead of studying your own history and your own literature, then you're not really independent, are you? You can choose your own leaders, but you're still learning more about Britain than you are about yourselves. I think that is an important message from the first essay. You should know what you're doing when you study the culture of another country. Or even if that country used to be part of your country or you used to be part of that country. Uh, and of course, like this is a currently a big debate in Taiwan, right? Uh, a lot of people, I think a lot of politicians are arguing about, oh, how much classical Chinese should high school students study? or like how much focus should we put on Taiwanese literature? But you know, a lot of that is politics. I think we can all agree we should study some classical Chinese and we should study some Taiwanese literature, right? The, the big part of the argument on the news and from politicians is how much. But I think as long as we can agree on the basic ideas, uh, we don't have to be too angry and violent about the specific details. And finally, question six, how are these related to the 20th century? Uh, one group took this question.
Let me go to the page. Wow, we really read a lot, huh? Okay, so, um, and they mentioned the big ideas, right? Decolonization and immigration and post-colonial literature. Decolonization in both essays. Now that the British have left, what do we do about culture? Immigration, especially in the second essay, talking about how Indian people go to uh, England, but also in the first essay, because it's not just about Kenya, it's not just about East Africa, it's about all of Africa. We know that um, many countries in the world today look like that shape on the map, right? The borders look like that because they were decided by the British or some other European country. A lot of many countries, uh, the, their borders don't match the distribution of different ethnic people. So like one group, uh, one ethnic people might be divided across two countries across the same border. So when we talk about decolonization, we almost always are also talking about immigration. When your extended family, when your people is divided across two countries, there's going to be a lot of immigration. And so all of these questions, if you put them all together, we call that post-colonial studies. And so literature that deals with these ideas is called post-colonial literature. And these two essays definitely are about this idea. The second essay is also directly related to the independence of India. Uh, and all of these changes are related to the end of World War II. Right after the war ended, Europe was too weak to keep control of their colonies. And so 1946 to 1949, so many countries became independent. This group also mentioned that there are now uh, that there were also more women writers. Here it's talking about the women playwrights in the UK. But with the counterculture, we do have a recognition of more women writers as well. So like, uh, where is it? When the author mentions these authors, right? Some of these are women, right? Anita Desai is a woman. So in his list of examples of important literary figures and artists, he also includes women. So that's also a reflection of uh, the late 20th century. And then when we talk about national culture, we're also talking about broadcasting, right? How to um, quickly spread and share information. Right. If you don't have broadcasting, then you depend on writing letters and that's very slow. It's hard to build a sense of community and identity that way. But with radio and television, uh, any debate about these issues can quickly spread across the whole area and the whole country. And this also is related to language. Radio uses language, television uses language. What language does it use? The British Broadcasting Company is famous for using so-called standard uh, received pronunciation, which is considered like the official pronunciation of British English. But nobody really talks like that. Not even the king talks like that. It's something invented to help bring the country together. Um, so all of these ideas are also related to mass communication and the language used in mass communication. So of course you also have television broadcasting here. Yeah, so those are some of the ideas that appear in uh, today's essay. Questions? Okay, next week. What are we doing next week? Oh, we're reading five really interesting poems. Great. So next week we're going to read five poems by Philip Larkin. Philip Larkin is, I think, 
I think he just recently, or not recently, but like he he is closer to. Is he alive or not? I want to find out. Is Philip Larkin alive? No, he died in 2016, but that, that was really close. No, 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 that's the wrong Larkin. Sorry. He died in 1985, but it's still quite close. Um, yeah, so his poems are more contemporary. They're less traditional. They have traditional elements, but they don't feel traditional. Uh, some of his poetry is actually uh, pointing out how the government is wrong or pointing out how the government doesn't care. Um, yeah, so it's like kind of the opposite of in Chinese, we say when you zai dao, right? Literature to send a spread a message. Larkin's poetry is kind of the opposite of that. And so we're going to read five of his very fun poems. They should be easier to understand. Next week, we're also going to begin the final exam. Uh, so the first half, we talk about these. The second half, I'm going to introduce the final exam. The exam will begin after class next week. It will go for one week. So during the last week of class, we're going to watch a movie. The movie will have nothing to do with anything. It's just for fun. Um, it will be based on an Australian novel. Australia, because Australia is also originally from British culture. You guys know, right? Australia was founded when Britain had no more space for prisoners, so they took a lot of prisoners and just sent them to Australia, and that's how their country started. So yeah, it should be fun. See you guys next week.